What's up, everybody? It's Joe LaPuma. You are listening. You are watching the Complex Sneakers Podcast. I am joined, as always, to my right, Mr. Matt Welty. Here we are. And to my left, taking another trip today. Here so we, we got we to keep this tight. Where are you headed to? Keep it tight. Do you want to tell them? It's not yeah. a vacation. What's your rule on if it's not a vacation? Do you let people know? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm going to L.A. for a couple of days for a Reebok event. There he is, Mr. Brendan Dunn. Yeah, I'll be back. I'll be back soon enough for another full size run shoot, more shoots, more stuff to publish. We're staying busy, gentlemen. You dropped a little Easter egg in last episode, and people figured it out pretty quickly. You yeah. saw the comments on yeah. our podcast. I was actually a little bit oh, confused yes. as to how people know, and we can say the name now because that episode It'll will be, be out. out Larry that June. Larry June is on full size run, and people were in our Twitter mentions, you know, dropping the orange I th- emojis. And I think maybe he had posted on like ig story or something that day during the shoot because there were quite a few people who yeah. for some reason already knew i, I love how uh, in tune the audience is they seem very excited yeah, about it searching yeah. out for every single clue glad about that yeah we got the john cusack of new york sitting to my left wow <laughs> me yeah wait where did this come oh, from oh i know exactly might be yankees might be mets oh my god oh, he's oh. referencing the john cusack Barstool sports beef where the guy oh. pulled up on him and, and called him out for being a Cubs fan at the Sox game. And Wealthy is I'm noting that you, Joe LaPuma, New York fan, supposed diehard Mets fan, as we said on this program a yeah. number of times, but maybe seen wearing a Yankee fitting how, from time to time. How uh, long did you keep that joke in? <laughs> I was, uh, you know We're what? One when it happened, seconds into this. Yeah, you, <laughs> when it happened, that was what, like, you know, when you go into something and you have like two things on your mind that you're like, you need to say? Heat rock, two heat rocks in <laughs> the stash. Was, that was one of them. Okay. And what's the other one? Oh, the other one is that I think. Our good friend Adam Caporell mm-hmm. needs to finally come to terms with his anti Tyson Fury bias. Wait, wait. So that's what I thought we were going to talk about for sure. You're a big Tyson Fury fan. I've always been a fan of Tyson Fury, yeah. And yeah, big, big fight. Did you watch? No, actually, but I did read about it afterward okay. because it was inescapable in the timeline. So I am more familiar with this fight than I am with most. And I read Tyson Fury's Wikipedia page. And connection, too. He's a, he has Irish, he's Irish yeah. traveler heritage yeah. or whatever. Exactly, yeah. exactly. What do you think? So Adam Caporell, sports editor, editor loves known, boxing, big, known boxing yeah. guy, Our resident so, boxing expert. So I've because I've liked Tyson Fury for I don't know like five six years at this point, and I remember saying to Adam how I thought Tyson was great for a heavyweight after he beat Klitschko, even though he doesn't throw super hard, he's like crafty and kind of shakes, and he was like yeah 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 discounting him beating Klitschko, and then mm-hmm. when he fought. Deontay the first time, who, even though it ended up being a draw, most people said that Tyson looked like he had won the fight. Adam still says, no, on my card, I think it was a draw. And then going into the second fight, he was like, Deontay's going to win. When was the second fight? Uh, this was like two years ago, okay. mm-hmm. pre-COVID. Okay. And he wouldn't admit that Tyson was going to win. He begrudgingly gave Tyson his props. And then he interviews Tyson. I'm Fier- sorry. Because I gotta, I gotta make sure I'm following along. Who won the second bout? Tyson, Tyson. Fury Tyson won, Fury I won think, in a seventh game. round knockout. Mm-hmm. Okay, he, but like very, very convincingly, decisively. Like, yeah. So going into this one, Adam interviews. He makes a big deal about wanting to interview Tyson Fury, or he interviewing Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury wins, and then he drops his pound for pound rankings, rankings, and puts Tyson Fury second to last in in the pound. After? After he, he just, won, did won he talk to him about it? I haven't talked to him about it yet, but he's going to hear this. <laughs> All right. Did he go super clickbait? Was that the idea? Well, <laughs> was he was he trying like, to rile people and he up. Put, he put Tyson Fury as the lead image and goes the pound for pound best rankings and puts him second to last. Even after the guy wins all these fights, he still can't. In his heart of all hearts. Is Tyson Fury the world champion or anything like that right now? Yes. Or I don't know how those titles yeah. work. In, but, so he's the world champion and Adam Caparello isn't impressed? Well, they rank, well, pound for pound is they rank all the divisions. And say who's like the best fighter out of like comparing the 145 pound to the hundred and or whatever the weight classes are. Yeah, it's like ranking who the best fighters are out of those weights. It was a gotcha. big fight. It was a big fight. I had that on the laptop, yeah. and I had Kim Kardashian SNL on. I haven't uh, watched it yet. It was the good. It's pretty good. Yeah, I saw some clips. I was I was pretty screenless this weekend. I was out in Montauk. So I saw, I saw that, that on your IG story. You, did you really wait? Hold on. Had we'll get time. to the hole in in one on mini golf, what, which what, was a joke. The hole in one. Hole two, one. two holes in one. Thank you. Hole okay. in ones. Okay, two, two holes, holes in one. In one. <laughs> well, holes where, in two. Well, where was the 
What was that sale? You not a garage sale. What was that? Okay, so did I was you at, buy any memorabilia? No, I did not. Okay, is that a I, Billy Joe King like uh, Adidas that you had? There? No, Bob Knight. Uh, Bob Knight. Oh, Bob Knight. Okay, Bob Knight. That's right. And a signed Shaq sneaker. Yeah, I, you wouldn't. No the, interest. B- the starting bid was six hundred dollars. Oh, that's. A, I mean, if I it could was get an a auction. steal, and yeah. it was just a one. Yeah, I think it was just a one shoe. So I was in Montauk this weekend. I went out there. Friday afternoon, I had to sprint from the Red Bull event where I was hanging out with Ben Felderstein all Just the way to Penn Station, grab the express train to the end of Long Island to Montauk, and, and got a little bit of input from Rich Antonello, another Long Island expert. So mm-hmm. both he and Ben were giving me recommendations for the weekend. One of the things that was happening there was the 40th annual, I don't know the exact title of the event, but the Clam Chowder Fest. Okay. So there in the town center in Montauk, there was a silent auction. There were a couple fundraiser type things, and then there was a thing where you could line up with your mug and get some clam chowder in there. And and the, the the lineup culture is alive and well out in Montauk because the line for the clam chowder was stretching to the back of the block. It looked like it looked like Kith in 2014. You know what I mean? See, I like this because beginning of the summer he was doing the tour of Italy in the city, and now he's doing the tour of Long Island. <laughs> well, I'm totally assimilating fall and your, winter your exactly, identity. and w- exactly in winter we're going to see what he does next. But I like this; it's a natural progression. So let me let me ask you this, and I know, this isn't this isn't meant to be a running bid or Please. to make any judgment. So I know that you had said to me in the past that your rule was when you leave New York, you're okay with eating meat, right? right. That's like your hard. It's a little bit. And I see where you're going. It's a little bit even more specific than that. It's when I leave the New York metropolitan area. So that's what I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So going to Long Island yeah. counts as leaving New York yeah, to you? Yeah, so I was able to eat meat while I was So there. No, I was just saying, were you able to eat the clam chowder? That's what I was getting oh, at. Oh, um, but I eat fish regularly oh, anyway. Okay. Yeah, but I did skip the clam chowder because I thought it was a little bit expensive. It was like $12. for. I thought you could buy – I'm sorry. we got to go into this. You buy the <laughs> mug of clam chowder. And then, like I said, you stand in line, and it's not yes. a short line. And and there's a bunch of people who are serving up their chowder, and they fill up your mug. But the, the mug costs $12, and then you have to buy a ticket every time you want to refill it. And it's like $12 for a mug out in out on the street? You know what I mean? I've got, if, if you in could this endlessly economy? refill the clam chowder, then I would have been I would have been going nonstop. But no, I, I, I didn't actually try the clam chowder. It's so. like two gallons of gas in California right now? <laughs> yeah, all-time high, baby. I was, You know what I did go hard on? The hotel I stayed at, they had a little pavilion area, okay. playing a lot of backgammon out there, and also they had nice. a s'mores set up. So in the now evening, that's great. In the, at night, are you guys big s'mores fans? Uh, if I had more opportunities, I would be. That sounds great. What a little fire pit? Yeah, a couple different fire. I pits, remember yeah. obviously all the fixins. Went camping a lot, like growing up. Yeah, but I would say. I remember as a kid, definitely a fan of like the burnt marshmallow situation. Yeah, I was gonna say, did, did rolling you rolling the stick? Yeah, but, but did you but like getting just let it, it on fire and like then... get it till it's so it's like crispy black on yeah. the outside, but like gooey on the inside? Yeah, I was a fan of that. I was I, that was my marshmallow strategy as a kid, but as an adult, I've tried to kind of slow roast it a little bit more. Okay. Joe, do you have a specific tactic when it no, comes to No, I haven't done it in a long time, but s'mores is something that if I was in that setting, I yeah. definitely would do it. Merrim, Merrim Hotel in Montauk, and check this out. This is a little insider baseball, but one of the guys working there works for BuzzFeed. Okay. Our new friends at BuzzFeed. That's nice. You're, so, doing ne- you're networking yeah. as well. Yeah, we're, we're coming together quick. I want to mention something sneaker-related that happened to me this morning. Sneaker-related? We're talking about clam chowder. We're yeah. going to talk about sneakers? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Stepped in dog shit about 100 yards <laughs> from the gym this morning. <laughs> ah! That has not happened to me in a long time. Yeah. Isn't that good luck? Yeah. What what sneakers were you wearing? Of course, I, I was wearing just a pair of Reebok. Nanos. And how fresh was the dog shit? Um. So sorry. There's I, it's like it's an uh, important question. As I go, I'm about like I'm on the home stretch of the gym. The gym's about like three quarters of a mile or half a mile from my apartment. Yeah. And there's a bodega where I take a left and I can see the gym down the yeah. the corner. And your eyes are on the gym. Yeah. And there's always like a bunch of guys hanging out side of the corner store Flipping or whatever tires. Oh, you know oh. what no, no, no in that like yeah. right where i take the left yeah. and as i go some guy says to me better watch yourself man this as the second i step into the dog shit oh no and i get into it and i'm like literally i wish it had happened right outside of my apartment so i could have at least like changed Based on the pile of shit do you think it was like a big dog a little dog i was just hoping that it wasn't human shit um <laughs> listen, <laughs> this, which there's a the big chance of but I get it, and I'm like, oh. sorry, eBay. We got to talk about this. Yeah, stuff. I get it, and I'm like, dude, I'm about to go into the gym. I don't want to like track this in yeah. because people are going to be doing burpees on the floor, like where I'm stepping, and it seems very <laughs> uh, unhygienic. So I I get to the door and I 
I because I have to ring the doorbell to get in. Mm-hmm. I take one shoe off and I just walk into the gym with one shoe and of course go into the bathroom and scrub it out. But this is great. This is a great story. <laughs> but but let's call this for what it is. Okay. He's literally right now reverse engineering the Reese clip for this week. This I know, is exactly, I know. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> this I'm is, not. Listen, and this, it's a good, it's a great story, but perfect. this is exactly I, I did not what do that on doing. purpose. This actually happened to me this morning. <laughs> the animated clip. Have you, sure. got, have you guys ever, not to get too much into it, but have you ever had that happen in like a coveted pair of sneakers? Where, I am an mm. expert at not stepping in dog shit. And people who I'm walking with, they'll be like, watch out. And, and I'm, I'm telling you. You like, treat it like a wide receiver. No, 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 the thing is like 12 feet back. I already scanned it Terminator style, and I know the exact angle and trajectory, and I'll just keep walking with my eyes forward and step right over the dog shit. Because I'm always, I have like a subconscious like map in my head of where all the dog shit is as I'm walking, so I'm never, ever going to step in it. I, Joe, I feel so confident. You know, uh, AirPods in, going down the phone, you've never not been aware of your surroundings and just... Not, no, not that. Uh, Maybe some puke. I kind of, you know, Amani Toomer from the New York Giants. He used yep. to. He was a make the mass- big ca- make the big catch in the. But Super he Bowl. always got two feet in bounds. That yeah. was his thing, right? Yep. Drag the feet. feet. Yeah. So I'm a little. I'm I'm good like that. You know, there's <laughs> been times. There's been times like. Step on a banana peel. No, there. You know, Mario was, Kart. You, no, you know, it was eye opening. Honestly, back in the day, I was on my phone, like. Yeah. And you always I, are. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, I almost went down an escalator the the like wrong way, and then I was like, "All right, you got to focus more." That that was like the closest. Was there dog shit on the escalator? No, no. Joe, if you had to guess your screen time per day, have, you ever, have you ever looked at it? I uh, I have my screen time. I'm not going to reveal it. What, I actually told. What would you put the over under at, Wealthy? Yeah, I want to hear. For no, for the week. For Hold the week. On. Oh, I don't no, know. No, no, it's the daily average for the week. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, I oh, think that's so. the one yes. that comes. The one it gives it to you on Sunday, right? Sunday. Well, yes. the que- the, yeah. I think that I can I preface it by asking one question. Hold on, you have to also preface it that I don't use Slack on my computer. I okay. use it on my phone. Okay. okay, but just just so I can make a fair uh, estimate, how many hours do you sleep a night? <laughs> Rough estimate. <laughs> He's getting into your vitals. Seven. We need a oh, you have to, okay. Ship. Six and a, six and a half, seven. So six is, and that goes down to eighteen. I would say you're a good waking hours. How much is that? 13 and a half hours per day. Hours? Not I'm not going to say anything. He's off, right? He's off by a couple. I'm not going to say I anything. I was going to put the over under at like 9 9 on the high end. He's closer. Oh, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> How many? I wonder, I wonder how who long could are sponsor you? an intervention. No, how long? I've gotten a lot better. Honestly, okay. do you do you I've feel? A lot have better. you ever had situation when when you're without your phone? Yeah. And do you feel jittery? <laughs> He's jittery I'm, right now. I'm talking o- about it. Look, I'm o- I'm always jittery, <laughs> but uh, I think the slack thing. Yeah, it contributes to it. Contributes a lot now. And well, see, since, do you know what yours is? No, yeah. I know, I know I that like, like you would be on it. I have. I'm usually around like four thirty or something like that. A day. Yeah. Four hours and 30 minutes. You definitely don't check Slack on the weekend. No, sir. You know how I know that? Tell me. Because we were talking kind of about the Virgil peak, the peak behind the curtain for the Air Jordan, Jordan 2. Series. Amazing rollout. And I think you were on, I saw a tweet where you were like, what happened or something. Yeah. We were talking about it in yeah. Slack. So that's a cool, you set rules kind yeah, of. Yeah, I try to have some, some boundaries. What's your guys' thoughts on all of a sudden the sudden appreciation for the Air Jordan 2? I w- was talking to him about it. I think anytime Virgil lets people in on the process it only adds yeah. to people wanting them more i think yeah. that's cool i mean i think it's what a collaboration is for to help people no, appreciate sure. certain things more so i'm not upset if people just, are suddenly into the jordan too rich yeah. antonello's favorite jordan uh, i think is a jordan too i also, didn't realize also that. Russ I see that oh shots to russ yeah but it's in trinidad james as well really yeah okay i like how you said trinidad james <laughs> like, yeah. not that other guy we know named trinidad. i'm not saying it's it's like funny or whatever but it's just the Air Jordan 2 has always been, like, I don't want to say malign, but just, like, not in yeah. that first batch of yeah. Air Jordans. For whatever reason, the Air Jordan 2 is always kind of viewed as, like, not the worst, but just kind of the least favorite. Yeah, especially since the Air Jordan 1 went up in cultural significance in the past five years. And that that's only left the Jordan 2 that much further behind. You know what I mean? Yeah. In this, in this era when everybody got into Jordan 1. Well, and also just the history of the shoe anyways, where Jordan himself supposedly didn't like yeah. the 2. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about it, you know, I think a couple months ago where 
people forget how big the Don C twos yeah. were. You know, like those shoes the quilted were quilted pair, the blue pair. Those shoes were massive. Yeah. Don C must have been his favorite Jordan as well, right? I feel like a, a lot of people. I can't it is off the top of my head, but it, it is kind of. Well, I'm not saying Don C is this person or Rich Antonello or Russ Banks and all these people, but it is at this point the one you pick when you're trying to sound like a real sneakerhead. You know, especially like, especially oh, two like lows. Jordan yeah. Two, yeah. Interesting. There were a few yeah. people I saw in. This isn't a shot or anything, but definitely when it's they a shot. <laughs> no, no, no. When they saw that uh, Virgil was doing the two low. If they had a pair of two lows, like how yeah. many two lows I saw broke out on the timeline, yeah, and how many people crumbled their two lows? On the <laughs> oh, just for the cloud of I knew about not it no, Virgil. but just because the shoe hasn't been around in a yeah, while, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know. But uh, I think the Don C, the reason, yeah, the reason why he had done that made shoe in Italy. made in Italy, yep. and he had the shoe inspired by his wife's handbag, so it was yeah. kind of like that whole tie-in. Yeah, cool rollout. I, I Definitely. Appreciate it. When did those drop? I don't think we have a firm date on it yet. I mean, who knows when anything is dropping right sure. now with the way the ports are and the congestion. Sure. No, nothing is what it seems at this point. It's hard, hard to track it all. Oh, I, I got I to gotta mention one more cultural event I did attend this weekend. I got to see our guy, Marco, at a little Soul Savvy meetup that I stumbled into. Okay. And that was after spending some time with my guy, Lei Takanashi, who I'm always happy to see outside. Okay. So Complex just, style, right? Yeah, exactly. Nice. Exactly. So Shouts to Marco. Yeah, met, met a lot of nice people at the Soul Savvy event, so salute to them. Fitting from your story about this morning that today's question comes from Parker Jung from Irvine, California. And Parker asks, what is your sneaker cleaning routine? <laughs> well, for wealthy, it's walk right into the gym and, <laughs> yeah. and then blast them with some hot water. <laughs> oh, wow. This is such an exciting question. But before we get to the question, I want to do the, the standard PSA. Let them know. Before we show the free yeah. sneakers that Parker's getting, how you get the shoes, you can submit a question for us to answer here on air at ebay.complex.com. Each week, we scroll through the questions. <laughs> we pick one out. If we answer your question here on the podcast, you will be getting a free pair of sneakers courtesy of eBay's Sneaker Authenticity Guarantee Program. And it's an exciting pair of sneakers. No, it week. really is. This is that, a, that this is a pair of sneakers. Out. Parker, I'm not sure if you're ready for them, <laughs> but uh, definitely an you, era. We always talk about eras you, on this podcast. Yes. This is definitely from an era. You, you need really a little bit of out? you need a little bit of swagger, as they say, to pull these off. Okay. <laughs> Didn't <laughs> okay. Show oh, Parker what he's getting. Today so just for everyone who's watching, you're not seeing double or you're not confused these are the same pair of sneakers mm -hmm. you're not it, seeing half yes this is and we have look at those the swagger look at those nike <laughs> terminator high this is the type of shoe that only matt welty would remember and adore i remember them okay the i shoes definitely from remember 2000 them. 2009 there's a magazine spread where lupe was wearing the shoe. I think I remember, and this goes even further down, that rabbit hole. I remember watching an episode of Maestro Nose, and he went to Japan and bought a pair of these. Okay. That same colorway? Yeah. This is the, yeah. And I remember just Oof. seeing it at the time and just being like, this can't be the same shoe. Oh, these yes. are crazy, man. <laughs> what what scenario could we see you wear those in? I don't know. I feel like... This the, is a big test for Parker, too. I feel like Brendan and... and uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but is this is put this on me. No, 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 no. Get your take on it. This okay. is a big, like, sort of a camo short streetwear era sort yeah, of shoe. I see it. I see it. Were for you sure. big on the camo shorts back in the yes. day, Joe? Yes. I never owned a pair of camo yes. shorts. Yes. I had a pair. I had a camo ten deep graphic tee that I quite loved, but ten never... deep had amazing graphic tees. Yeah. Ugh. Come wow. On. These are uh, these are a shoe, and they're authentic, as you see by the tag yes. on there. So the question I think was, what is our sneaker cleaning routine? So I feel like wealthy is the best one to yeah. Let's hear yours. I don't really have much on this, <laughs> but yeah, I don't really have much on, yeah. on this because I kind of like my sneakers dirty. But nowadays, don't clean them as much. But I felt like way back in the day, big on sneaker cleaning, and there's so many rituals I feel like that are involved in sneaker cleaning and yeah. techniques that you learn yeah. over the years, especially when you're coming up, first getting into sneakers, and you only have three or four like good pairs yeah. and you don't want oh, them yeah. to look beat um i think everyone at some point or another has bought a pair a uh, bought a pair bought a can of like footlocker the, yes. ye the yellow top 
Oh, we, I used to sell spray, I don't know that. spray foam. I don't know that. I'm sorry. I used to sell it, it, finish oh, line yeah, yeah, scuff yeah. and stain yeah, yeah. eraser. Um, all those that cleaners. only works on like white leather yeah. shoes. Um, everyone's bought, you know, the repellent at yep. some point. Nowadays, it's a little more elevated. Elevated. You have Jason Marks, Sneakers ER, yes. yep. brands like that. Who? Because the hardest part back then was cleaning shoes with uh, suede on it. Um, Still is the hardest part. Yeah, you yeah. have to be very careful. I think everyone's ruined a pair of shoes while trying to clean them. I recently tried to clean the CDG Air Max 95s, the white. Mm. It's very tough, but yeah, Jason Mark. J Jason Mark, I've used here and there for sure. You I know what? I, I will echo wealthy sentiment here and say that it was such an important ritual to learn, and I feel like it's one of those things that separates and we talked about this a lot recently, people who are really into sneakers mm -hmm. versus people who just wear their sneakers. If you're not a sneaker collector or a sneaker head, then you wouldn't necessarily have the idea to go and clean them on a regular basis or keep them clean. Well, there's the iconic photo yes, of Brendan photo Dunn of in at, at his, yes. at his uh, whatever party you were at or yes. hanging out and you were like wanting to show everyone and how good you were at cleaning <laughs> shoes. No, it wasn't that I wanted to show people that I was good at cleaning shoes. It was just so much fun to me, like reading on sites like Nike Talk at the time, mm -hmm. what the right way to do it is. I think I mentioned it before here, but getting the barkeeper's friend. Did you have Seaglow? No, I never see glowed a, a, a pair of Jordan 11s or anything like that to, to, to get them looking icy again. But I remember, yeah, definitely times in college where I would just feel super energized about cleaning shoes and have yeah. Mike Irwin give me his white leather Air Max 90s and just scrub them down as much well, as I could. Well, it's a great feeling to when, it, yeah. when it's dirt, like, yeah. the, These when days, you clean them and, and white leather sneakers, like, Something I guess you know nothing not, about. Which Joel, no, which no, Joel Puma actually wore recently in the true. Kith we'll editorial. Get to that. We'll yeah. get to that with our guest because um, I asked him. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But I remember like a white leather part of sneakers. It's pretty easy to clean, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. And then so like. satisfying. It, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's, it's very like satisfying. It, videos. Exactly. It just like, it comes right off. Yeah. What I want to ask you guys when you were young, and I know this is a big no-no, but I've definitely done it. Have you put. Did you ever put sneakers in a washing machine? You can do it. If I you... did it, and all you, sorry, all you heard was da dum da dum. Yeah, I've done da -dum. it. With, so I've you can do it. The the kind of technique, I guess, that saves it is you have to put it in a pillowcase. Oh, right. and don't put it in a dryer because it yeah. could uh, melt the glue around it. I, I root a pair of Pegasus sneakers. I'm there was a kind that. of viral picture that went around like 2014 of someone who put their Nike Flyknit racers, I believe, in yeah. the in the dryer, and the shoe actually shrunk. <laughs> yeah. These days when I'm doing sneaker cleaning, I usually just do the wipes. So Crep Protect yep. or Jason Mark, they have those wipes. They're if good, if yeah. anybody wants to send me, we've made this joke before, a, a, a ton of wipes or cleaning product, please just send the entire box because those those are really the nice. Jason Mark yeah, wipes are great. I don't always have the time to yeah. break out the brush and things like that. I've actually been meaning to do some cleaning lately. I've done the brush. Yeah. Not I forget what it was. With the hot water, it's just such a But it's it such a really works. I, I forget what shoe it was on, but I've done it. Pretty recent. But you need to be careful though when you're doing the suede and stuff yes. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Sweet can't stuff. just you can't just get it super wet and just scrub yeah. it. You need to put a little bit of water and you need to like pat and dry yeah. it. Yeah. Do you guys ever um, iron out the creases like on the toe box? No, I've never do done that. I, I've I would, been, I've I been mess tempted that up. to do that a lot lately. Somebody in my life has worn down a pair of white and black dunks quite a bit, and I need to iron. Sometimes these toe boxes just fold right up, especially in the Let rain. Let us know if that works. Yeah, you, you never did that? You never tried never. to iron out the creases in your sneakers? That's another one that I've, I've, I'm have i like, I gotta I gotta just set a couple pairs aside and, and do that. Anyway, Parker, great pair. Yep. Interesting pair. Yeah. A great pair. <laughs> a great pair. You, you walked back a great, great interesting quick. pair. You weren't gonna say classic, that's we'll for sure. We'll put the Lupe photo in, <laughs> yeah. though, for context. In a, good, in a good Dom Kennedy lyric, very early on. Please? First mixtape, that uh, ties this all in. He said, shoe cleaner, heck no. A rag and some wet soap. Okay. Love that. Love that. All right. All right. There, there you go, Parker. Please steer clear of any dog shit. Now that we have that out of the way, Joe, I think it's time to bring on our guest. Yes. Our guest on today's podcast is a media icon who served as GQ's creative and fashion director for over 40 years. Currently, he's the publication's creative director at large. 
During that unprecedented run, he was part of the most noteworthy images and magazine pages at the storied brand. Besides styling and executing photo shoots with everyone from Michael Jordan to Kanye West, when it came to his pen, it was his cosign you were after if your product was about to hit or was out in the market. His career is captured best in his Hunks and Heroes book that released in 2019, and just last week, his latest editorial project in collaboration with Ronnie Fikes Kith was released, a 300-page book that documented 10 years of the brand. We're here to talk his history, so please welcome the legendary Jim Moore. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. That was really we could have won and we, sweet. <laughs> no problem. We could have went much longer, but you have such a history. Oh. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you, Joe. So yes. happy to be here. Yes. Jim, we got to talk you. about the sneakers right away. We want to yes. know about the sneakers you arrived in. We, we, it's a little ritual here for us to discuss our shoes. At the that makes sense. So, yeah. so can you tell us about the New Balances you have on feet? Yeah. So I'm at, I'm, I discovered New Balance about, I got to say, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, most of my job is just standing around on concrete floors <laughs> at photo studios, <laughs> 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 being nervous. Right. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, directing the shots. But uh, I finally, you know, I was like a Converse guy and I was a little bit of a, you know, a Vans guy and mm -hmm. Adidas guy. But, you know, someone said you should be wearing New Balance because they're just going to be better for your your legs and your back. I'm a yeah, tall person. Your long term health. Functional. So, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, long before like, you know, geezer chic or cool dad style or whatever, I was wearing New Balance. People were like, oh, wow, my dad wears those and, you know, all that. At least I didn't go for the Velcro ones. Well, you, <laughs> and, you got kind of like the Steve Jobs sort of, you know, the, the black turtleneck <laughs> with the New Balance sneakers on. So I usually introduce myself. Hi, my name is Jim Moore. I wear a lot of black turtlenecks. Yeah. And that's about all, you, yeah. all I can say. Uh, so anyways, I've been wearing them for a long time, the 990. Um, so, you know, forgive me with the numbers, but mm -hmm. it's like in the beginning, the the super old school ones yeah. that were a little less aerodynamic, so to speak. Uh, the 990, you know, I've been probably wearing this for five or six years. And this particular sneaker is really special to me because Ronnie Feig from Kith yep. gave it to me. And the most special thing about it is that he gifted one to Eugene Tong, mm -hmm. who hey, styled the book. Shout out to Eugene, yes. my dear friend, shout old out man to run Eugene. club, hello. And one to himself. So there was a day that we all showed up in the same sneaker. Nice. But if I could roll the film back a little bit, uh, one of my favorite moments working with Ronnie was when I took them out of the box and I started to lace them and he grabbed them away from me. He's like, I lace your shoes. Ha! I, I, I've, I've heard Ronnie say that so many times about despite the level that he's at in the industry, he still feels like that shop boy or that person on the stockroom mm -hmm. floor where 100%. he's gonna lace the sneakers up for you. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. So, so he, I put them on, and then he saw that the laces were too long. <laughs> so he has this way of like stringing them back through. I have to say they're not the e easiest to get on, but mm -hmm. it's like when they're on, they're they're tight and they're perfect. So um, I always look down at them and think, cool color combination. You know, it's a Kith collaboration. I'm super happy to have them. But the the fact that he laced them for me is the thing that makes them really. Precious. Now it's like you can never untie them. Or something. Never. Yeah. Never. <laughs> well, if you got the dip them in bronze. Today? <laughs> yeah. I know Joe doesn't really wear white shoes. I very hardly wear black shoes, but broke the rule today doing a white mountaineering Saucony uh, grids. So I like yeah. them. You've been doing the Saucony thing a little bit more recently, right? Yeah. What, and what, what, what motivated that decision? I don't know. I always kind of liked the brand, but I haven't worn as much of it over the years. And our good close friend and co-host, Trinidad James, yes. has a Saucony shoe coming That's out. right. That's right. Important project to support. Yes. That's a good-looking sneaker. Thanks. I like the black and white pattern. Joe? New Balance 990, Joe Fresh Goods. Had the support. Really excited about these. The blue mesh. You don't see blue mesh a lot. I feel like on these new balances, a lot of yeah. times the mesh is like gray or, you know, an off gray or navy or something. But that really crisp blue looks so good. Also comes with multiple sets of laces. I went with the blue. Did Ronnie lace them up for you? No, he didn't <laughs> lace okay. them up. Uh, <laughs> he didn't lace them up, but I went with the blue. And we'll see how I feel. I may switch them out. But uh, yeah. for today... One with the blue. Yeah. Jim, can you it's see It's a real take on the earth earth tone, because yeah. usually you see this color, but then they'll kind of pile on other earth tones. But Definitely. the blue really against that tan looks, looks Are really Are you the sort of guy, can you wear bright shoes? I know you normally tone it down a little bit, but. Um, you know, I'm looking at those and appreciating them on you, but right. probably not on me. Okay. But if I were to wear anything bright, it would probably be in the sneaker realm. Yeah. 
Um, I'm doing something pretty predictable. You know where my allegiances lie. This is a Packer Reebok collaboration, and I'm okay. friends with both of those entities, so always happy to rep them on feet. Jim, we want to get back into your yeah. your sneaker preferences, and I guess kind of your history with sneakers. Can you tell us, as a young man in uh, in Minnesota, what sneakers meant at that point culturally? You know that they weren't this big phenomenon that they are now. Like, how important were sneakers in in that moment? And, and where were you seeing sneakers on a regular basis? Sure. I mean, I was uh, I was a child of the disco generation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was a disco kid. And I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, always wishing I was from Minneapolis because <laughs> that was the bigger and better city. And much the way I kind of feel in the south side of Williamsburg when people say, oh, I don't know if I've been to the south side of mm -hmm. Williamsburg, mm -hmm. I felt that when I lived in St. Paul, like people from Minneapolis, like, oh yeah, that's across the Mississippi, right? <laughs> much it's less like it's four miles much less away. Roseville. Right, Roseville, right. exactly. It's four miles away. It's not that far away. So, you know, there was this club called Uncle Sam's, which then turned into First Avenue. Mm -hmm. And if you ever saw Purple Rain, you would know that that's the club where Prince performed. Wow. And he uh, he was you know, he started as, they had an amateur night on Wednesday nights. And we didn't like amateur night because we just wanted disco music. Mm -hmm. And um, so Prince headlined amateur night and soon it was Prince night. So Wednesdays were Prince night. And when I eventually moved to New York, I was very amazed that um, people were listening to his music because he seemed like a local to me. I didn't know he was going to be this huge sensation, even right. though I thought he was really funky and cool. Uh, but so I was like a hard sold this, I swear this tangent will come back. <laughs> uh, so I was kind of like fancy shoe person, yeah. right? Like you side had buckle to wear those shoes or to get into these types yeah, of things. exactly. But if I was to wear a sneaker, it was a Cortez, mm. yeah. and it was you know definitely you know I had a '69 Firebird, which was vintage then, and you know orange with a white top, white vinyl top, and. You know, I if I were to wear a sneaker, it would probably be a Cortez, you know, with a cool track pant. And but I always had to have something a little glamorous, like a little yeah. corduroy bomber jacket, or was wearing aviators. Mm -hmm. You know, were you going to the Mall of America to buy sneakers back then? <laughs> the Mall of America wasn't built yet, okay. but uh, I had already moved to New York when it was built. But when I went there for the first time, it was like kidney candy store. It was quite incredible. Those Nike Converse specifically, was that something that you sought out? Because I, I know you moved to New York in like 77, so you yes. were around when Nike first became a brand and maybe can remember them coming onto the scene. Do you remember just just what an impact that made? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because Adidas was kind of still exotic in those days, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because it was considered European. So you would have, you know, the shell toe was pretty big in those days and you know, some of the more basic styles. And then Nike seemed to be this like American brand that was kind of, you know, giving us this portal into, you know, the new, you know, the new universe. And it was the Cortez for me that I just thought had really good lines to it because mm -hmm. I was always looking for something that was a little bit sleek mm -hmm. and not too jazzy. So I did like Adidas, but when Nike came along, it just seemed like the cool, the cool brand, the new kid in town. Did, did you get to meet Phil Knight through all the years at working at GQ or? I didn't, nor did I ever meet Prince, which is <laughs> unusual. Damn. But, yeah. What was it like being in New York for kind of like the Jordan boom? Like, do you remember those days? You know, you, you got there a little earlier and then seeing that, what was that like? That was, you know, 77 was, you got to think about what 77 was. Mm -hmm. So. Son of Sam was still on the loose. Okay. And there was the Did first... Did you ever meet him? <laughs> <laughs> Never met him, thank God. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was glad when I caught him. Like, <laughs> right. right decision, moving to this big bad city. Oh right, God. right. Uh, the, big, the first like big blackout. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, this is the summer of 77, and also the opening of Studio 54. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was, it was a pretty epic year. There were some good films made that year. So... Uh, you know, Times Square was as seedy as can be. Mm. You know, it was almost a badge of honor, courage, if you got mugged. For some reason, I got never got mugged, knock mm. on wood. But I think it was because I was uh, tall and someone told me early on, just look like you're determined or you're crazy or okay. both. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
they won't bother you. But uh, it was pretty raw in New York in those days, mm -hmm. and it was exciting. And, you know, Jordan was, you know, I've never been a big sports fan, yeah. so my interaction with, with athletes is really when I photograph them. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I have to do a little bit of research, mm -hmm. but I'm basically, my research is more like, do I have to have something custom made? Will they fit in this? Mm -hmm. Will, you know... LeBron be able to wear John Elliott sweats or whatever it is. Mm. So um, my first experience with Michael Jordan was working with the the uh, cover photographer, GQ cover photographer, Richard Avedon, mm -hmm. who I did about 40-some covers with. Wow. And he was located on uh, 75th Street between 1st and York. And I was be on 71st between 1st and York. So I'd bring the clothes home the night before, and then I would just walk up there. Now, now this is a, these are the days where you just brought a few things. Mm -hmm. You didn't bring racks and racks of designer clothes. Yeah. So I'd had a suit made for him, and you know he was a young buck. He was just starting out. And uh, super excited to put him on the cover. But I was dealing with a photographer who didn't know who knew less about sports than I did. Yeah. So he didn't know anything about him. Sure. So we had to write his name on his palm of his hand and and uh you know it was a really special day so when you say michael jordan i have to immediately go back to my yeah my cover experience with him so he the, the guy's referencing like oh this is michael jordan right <laughs> uh michael this is dick avedon <laughs> nice to meet you and uh i think he what what avedon liked about him was that he had these incredible moves and he kept saying oh you're like a dancer you're mm -hmm. like, like <laughs> it's actually like a, a basketball player but he would he was doing these really incredible moves there's a picture in my book we did a whole portfolio but there was something about and you know five or six years of working with Avedon but I just decided one portrait would kind of sum it up and it's the one where where Michael Jordan's palming the ball and right. he's kind of in the, the dribbling position. Yeah, he's wearing like the Jordan 4s and he's yeah. in the Bulls uniform. Yeah, exactly. Were, were brands involved at that point? Because, it, it you know, Nike were so much the image makers when it came to Michael Jordan or had such a big role in creating him as an icon or as this legendary figure through the shoes, of course, but also just through the images that they put out there. Were, were, right. were Nike involved at that point with, with Michael Jordan coming for a photo shoot? I think Nike was involved early on, but I think they they just dipped their toe in the water. But yeah. I think they were more interested in, you know, starting this new stream of culture and getting people to recognize the brand through really snappy advertising campaigns and really compelling images. And uh, you know, th there's there's not that much difference between then and now when you talk about athletes and hero worship and mm -hmm. all of that but i think there were only a few players that stood out as you know the gods and and jordan was one of them but i think i think nike was they were kind of towing the line between between both they were they were starting to endorse the athletes and realizing as the money was coming in that they could be they could be the brand they could be the brand they could really own the space across the board. Jim, when I think of GQ in sneakers, one of the things that comes to mind is the whole like pioneering of the sneakers and suits look. Right. How much of a role do you think, you know, you maybe played in that or GQ kind of played in creating that as kind of like a cultural phenomenon? Um, I, I could probably take a lot of credit for that just because it was an idea I had. So, so one thing that was always important for me, so I'm a, I'm a modernist, so I'm not someone who looks back a lot. Mm -hmm. I like to look forward. I tend to, you know, putting my book together was, uh, was an interesting process. It wasn't in the beginning something I was looking that forward to because I had to look back at all this stuff mm -hmm. I did. I'd much rather look forward. So, um, but I was always kind of the one that when the film came in, be like, oh, you did lace ups without socks and you did a suit with a t shirt. Now, things like that don't seem radical yeah. today, mm -hmm. but in those days, you know, to bring it to a very conservative editor in chief in 1984, mm -hmm. who's wearing suspenders and a polka dot tie, Art Cooper okay. was his name. And, you know, he was really that guy. You know, he was mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, straw hat and seer sucker suit and mm. and that's cool you know but i was always there to i actually didn't love the the 80s and the fashion so i was always trying to push against that and 
kind of finding a, a softer way to like, uh, uh, you know, give a different attitude to the suit. So I was probably the first one to put a t-shirt under it and, mm -hmm. and put no socks with dress shoes. And then I was in Hawaii and we were doing this story and we had a couple suits with us and I believe it was an accident. We were doing a really casual story mm -hmm. and I was using all old school Stan Smiths, Cortez. Mm -hmm. I was using all Converse, Vans, just canvas sneakers. It was kind of a story of this guy who was in his 40s and he had, you know, he had gone back to a, a town where he'd met a girl. And I always like, I, I always like um, to paint pictures and tell mm -hmm. stories and, and, and give people a little bit of a script. So, you know, at that point I was really into bucket hats and aviator sunglasses and sweatpants were just starting to like look cool. And so I started to mix some of the, some of the, the suit jackets mm -hmm. in because it was just kind of, I think it was an accident that the suits were there. And then at the very end, I thought, you know what, this is a great space place it was this bowling alley it had this great sign on it and let's put let's put him in a suit and I remember the photographer saying like I think it's just gonna look so odd because what's he doing in a suit and I was like well a suit can be something casual as well and I put the sneakers on and then um, do you remember which sneaker it was specifically it was I think it was just a Jack Purcell yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah and it was a cotton linen suit and Shortly after that, I went to Hawaii and did the same thing with a pair of flip-flops and a suit. Mm -hmm. Got my hand slapped both times. <laughs> didn't, know, didn't know if the pictures were going to run, mm -hmm. um, but they did. And I think, uh, you know, that might have been, I might not have been the only one doing it then, but it was, it was definitely in the culture. Was there a shoot after that where you put a celebrity in a suit and sneakers that you were like, see, now, not that you're validated, but now, look at, we came from the Hawaii shoot, and now I'm putting this celebrity in a suit and sneakers. Yes, because at that moment in what I felt was, you know, in my tenure at GQ or whatever the culture was going, is I wanted everything to be a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. So I remember taking loafers and just like breaking them down or, or getting old Gucci loafers at, this is long before Tom Ford mm -hmm. came into Gucci, and getting old vintage loafers and wearing them without socks and putting... You know, do you know what Hirachis are? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So oh, actual, not, not, Nike not the sneakers, Hirachis. but the <laughs> like, real the sandals. Are too. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sandals, the right? Yeah, sandals. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Mexican sandals. And I went to, uh, like I said before, I went to Hawaii. And, you know, these were the days when we were kind of spinning the globe. Mm -hmm. Like we had the budget. So what we were era going, is this about? This is uh, mid to late 80s. Okay. So it's like, oh, let's go to Cairo and do a shoot. Let's mm -hmm. go to India. Let's go to, you know, Peru, uh, places like that. And so it was. For me, it was a way to kind of identify a new way of dressing, yeah. which is a little bit, it was tailored and it was chic, but it was relaxed and it was mixed with these things that you might travel with, like a mm. pair of flip flops mm. or a pair of Jack Purcells or a pair of Vans because that was very lightweight. And I really love the idea of, you know, a varsity sweatshirt or something with, a, with an insignia on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was probably the one I mean, I know it's the one at GQ mixing the brands. Mm -hmm. It was never someone who liked to liked to put anything in the magazine head to toe. Mm -hmm. and even, even sportswear brands, because you know, in this world, even yeah. sports sneaker brands. world, we wouldn't necessarily. If you wear Adidas socks with Nike sneakers, you're like get crucified for it. Right. You're that, okay with that, Jim? That's now. That's mm. now. But in <laughs> but in those days, it was about creating this look of personal style. Mm -hmm. This guy who had confidence to wear to put a bunch of stuff together, a little bit of a mashup. So. You could do Adidas, you know, track pants with uh, Cort Nike Cortez, sneakers. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and then maybe like a sport jacket and then, you know, a Ralph Lauren, you know, sweater underneath or whatever. So I, I, for me, it was always about the mix. It didn't, it didn't happen until later in the 90s when the designers started being, you know, kind of started, hey, can you at least, you don't have to use our clothes, you know, right off the runway, but... We'd so the designers were saying, like, we want this to be a cohesive, coherent look that is more thoroughly just our own stuff. Yeah, but it was never my intention to look out for anyone but the reader yeah. and mm -hmm. give them what I thought was great style and advice and service. You have you have one month and you have this magazine's with, with 100 pages of editorial to really talk to talk to these guys. And it was wasn't until the late '90s when we got a new editor in chief that, 
you know, it was time to demystify fashion. It was time to really, you know, show them how to do it and be a little bit more serviceable. But leading up to that, I was the guy who always mixed things up because I was definitely much more about, you know, doing the painting with several different brushes, not not doing things head to toe. If I saw something amazing and Ralph was one of the designers that, that did it the best, I would still do something to mix it up a little bit, like put a classic sneaker with it. Or mm -hmm. maybe if he did something all in green with Safari, maybe I'd still put something Ralph Lauren in there, but mix it up at, with a different color. And I would have to confront some of the designers and talk to them about this because it was a, it was something we really believed in at the you magazine. You told them pull up and we'll <laughs> What's that? You pulled up on them? Yeah, and you know, I think I got through to a few of them, hopefully, but yeah. I you know I got them to realize that, you know, American men buy clothes differently. Mm -hmm. And if I put a you know, Valentino blazer with a pair of Levi's jeans that guy is not going to be like, oh, I wish they would have put it with Valentino pants. Right. You know, <laughs> they're going to dig it because they're going to see that contrast. And wearing a blazer with a pair of jeans doesn't seem like anything uh, these days. Right. But in those days, yeah. it was it was quite radical. Was it a full circle moment for you then? Because you talk about, you know, putting the sneakers with the suits back in the 80s. And then I feel like, you know, around maybe... 2012 2013 you know you kind of have like the menswear reemergence boom made in america you know a lot of guys were wearing suits and all that sort of stuff again and then i feel like the sneakers finally broke through again to that audience you know around like 2013 where you saw j crew doing sneaker collaborations and feeling yes. a little more comfortable yes. doing that was that like another like aha moment for you to see like sneakers go into like the GQ world again, aside from hard bottoms? Yeah, it was a proud moment for me because I felt like the 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 culture had, had finally realized that it's not about a matching look, so to speak. It's not mm -hmm. about, it's about, you know, having an emporium or a retail space that offers, you know, collaborative products, that offers third party merchandise, that gives you, um, a chance to stay in there a little bit longer and maybe buy a few more clothes. And I always say to retailers that might be having a little bit of a problem, said this the other day to someone who um, I'm helping now, is you have nothing on your walls, you have nothing on your mannequins that show guys how to wear any of this stuff. So, you know, w women have a different chip. They know how to, you know, collectively gather things from other places. They're just stylistically, they're more advanced than men. But men just, they need you to lead them to water and then show you how to do it. And I feel like, you know, that was the reemergence of, you know, not only can you wear like the J. Crew khakis and the linen shirt and you can throw a sweatshirt over your shoulders but then we've got the new balance that mm -hmm. we collaborated with so you know just, just don't do that j crew gingham shirt the blue and white check one the blue and white one i think that'll ever come back <laughs> i hope not <laughs> <laughs> did you own one i never did okay. i'm proud to say that i right. never did okay. we, i know you you know probably working at gq you get sent ton of clothes and all that sort of stuff or were they were the sneaker brands just sending you personally like every single sneaker that came out as well or would you have to ask for certain things or i mean i try not to take anything unsolicited because i don't like taking anything that i don't think i'm actually going to wear mm -hmm. if you you know it's something to have someone send you something these sneakers from Ronnie that I'm going to yeah. wear mm -hmm. until they fall apart because I love them and they mm -hmm. go with my color scheme and I mm -hmm. appreciate it. But to send me something is is very, very nice. I certainly don't want to offend people if they send me clothes. But for the most part, um, I'm going to be a little bit more jazzed if it's something that I, I really want to wear. Do you remember when you realized that there were groups of men who were obsessed with sneakers? Because it seems like this world that that we kind of come from of sneaker collecting happened in parallel to this world at GQ that was men very focused on what they were wearing kind of from an apparel standpoint. And it's kind of interesting because I feel like they're two very separate discrete groups, yeah. mm -hmm. but they didn't really overlap in, until, you know, I think maybe the past 10 years. But you, again, you have like men in America who are obsessed with sneakers and collecting yes. them. Do you remember when you first realized that was a thing? I think I first realized that thing in the middle of... Uh, probably 2000, 
eight or nine, somewhere mm-hmm. in there. It's just week. an interesting because, like, again, you're you're working in in this world, but yes. it, it it's the sneaker world is separate from that, but it's the same kind of idea about being so tuned into what you're wearing, or that it can mean something about your identity or about your culture. Definitely, and the sneaker tidal wave was coming. It was already you know on its way, and you know how do you make sure that GQ stays a style magazine, Mm -hmm. integrates all of this product that's coming, all these sneakers, but there's so much of it Mm -hmm. that, you know, how many pages do you give to sneakers? So then we would, we would handle sneakers just like we handled it anything else. It was a trend we believed in, Mm -hmm. let's say high tops. Then we're going to do like, you know, our 10 favorite high tops and we will call in 300 pairs of high tops to get it down to those to those 10 pairs and that is really important to me when I was at GQ it was very important that the fashion closet was the laboratory mm-hmm. that if you saw something in the magazine where it was like the 10 best white jeans under 100 bucks you can be sure we tried on a couple hundred pairs of jeans mm-hmm. and it, so we so there was truth in advertising cuz I'm a consumer You tried on every pair of jeans Jim? not me personally okay. <laughs> I'm just, not I'm, a I want to know like what the wear testing Thank you is for like pointing that out you you right. like you do one lap around the block or how much is enough <laughs> right. the jeans to make right. sure they've been properly tested so you know it's kind of rapid fire but you know we go through the process yeah. and so if back to the back to the story so if it was if we thought high tops were cool and we would do a mix of maybe sneaker specific brands and designer brands so you'd have something like a Louboutin in there but you'd also have something like a Nike in there and then after that spread then there might be four to six pages of like you know how to wear high tops because Mm -hmm. you can you can never give enough information to guys you can never assume that they know that they can wear high tops or they can't wear high tops with a certain kind of pant like you know the 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 response to something like that is is mind-blowing because people are like i didn't know that like you know i could wear sweatpants with high tops as long as i pull them up a little bit Mm -hmm. or i didn't know that there's a certain like the sneak of short that looks better with the high tops you try to kind of build all the secrets style secret sauce into it so you're kind of demystifying it and you're celebrating at the same time so when the sneaker craze came there was probably i would say every other month there was something about sneaker whether it be in the front of the book or whether Mm. it be in the well and certainly styled throughout and that was i call that the geezer chic area era where we were putting new balance with you know brunello suits and Mm -hmm. you know really sneakers almost with anything a running sneaker with a suit and a shirt and tie and a briefcase was a was a cool thing in those days and it wasn't considered radical anymore it was considered radical at the beginning and it ran its course but it certainly looked good especially if it was coordinated if the color was coordinated mm-hmm. what do you think about 2015 when saint laurent did the takeoffs of the black and red Jordan 1 and the royal blue Jordan 1, and they did those high tops. I remember it was yep. around like the On Noir yep. era. Yep. And right. I think like Rob Garcia from On Noir was like the first one to have it. But what did you think when you saw that, like a high fashion brand doing a takeoff of this iconic sneaker? That's that's a good question. I, believe it or not, what's today, Tuesday? Sunday, I'm moving to, I'm moving apartments, so I'm, doing, I'm mm-hmm. just getting rid of stuff, and I got rid of the black and yellow mm-hmm. Celeron okay. version of the one you're talking about. Yeah. Because it was just kind of falling apart. And I've always not because you didn't appreciate it. No, not because I didn't appreciate it. I probably had it for 10 years. Yeah. So it was time. You know when it's time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, we're working yeah. on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, yeah. We just had this discussion yeah. last we're week on when, it. when yeah. it's time you to could, get rid of a pair of shoes. Yeah. When it's time, then you go a little bit past it, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then you can't go any farther. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sad. Yeah. But there it goes in the dumpster. So that particular era was was interesting because now it's like full throttle sneaker athletes mm-hmm. active culture is inspiring high fashion mm-hmm. and that is almost a yeah, direct correlation mm-hmm. right and yeah I guess the question is more what did what did Nike think of right. it you know in right. a way but you know we liked it because it was fashion and the colors were strong yeah. and it could live for us in a story it could live with with the Nikes could live mm-hmm. with other high tops and that was a great moment because it was really um, 
it was really that intersection of like an active sneaker yeah. with fashion. So, yeah, but I remember seeing the first pair going down the runway. I was like, that looks familiar. Mm -hmm. And then the next season was was a Vans situation. Yeah. So, were were yeah. you excited to see like that whole era where someone like Raph Simmons did the Stan Smith in his in his like own take? Was that like? intersection of your worlds or yeah i think so eddie kind of did his version of the air force one mm -hmm. and then and then someone like raf actually turned it into a collaborative effort mm -hmm. and i remember when in the shows in paris junior watanabe was one of the first to do really authentic collaborations you know really thoughtful authentic collaborations with converse and and nike and one of and the first for Nike too. He actually yes. got the first ninety nine. He did yes. the first yeah. like pre distressed yeah. Nike shoes that they yes. made for like the runway show. Yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. and he was he was kind of. I mean, Ronnie's the new king of the collaboration, mm -hmm. you know. But mm -hmm. Junior was probably doing it, you know, long before. And I remember he would combine. I remember once there was a Carhartt collaboration, a Brooks Brothers collaboration, a Nike collaboration, a Converse collaboration, all in one outfit, mm. which I thought was was kind of interesting. It's kind of, you know, he's putting a stake in the ground, but also like this is the this is the time of the collaboration. And I was asked kind of midway through that whole trend, like, when is this going to end? And I was like, it doesn't have to end because that's what creativity is, and especially in menswear, that's where we get to really play with some you know, some some iconic brands and wake them up a little bit mm -hmm. at the same time. I worked on the um, L. Bean collaboration with Todd Snyder and we had no idea that it was going to to take off the way it did. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just, you know, that's what that's what's really fun about co collaborations. I mean, that's that's one of the. You know, there's so much to be said about what Ronnie's doing at Kith, but, you know, his collaborations are so they're so authentic to him and they're so respectful to the brand as well. And th they're exciting. I think one of the other kings of collaboration you have to mention in that same vein is Virgil Abloh. Of you know, course. He's on top of the world right now. Can you talk about just seeing his ascendance in the past decade? Yeah, you know, I knew Virgil when he was with Kanye, because Kanye and I go back a long time, we're buddies. And he um, broke away and started started this line called Pyrex. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Hold on to your Pyrex if you have any. <laughs> um, I have a pair of shorts. Uh, nice. So you still wear them? What's that? You still wear the Pyrex shorts? I do. Yeah, I, I do. love that. I don't want them to like, it's like my helmet Lang pieces. I don't want them to fall apart. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You hit the gym hit. in them in the morning or is it like, uh, what's the gym? gym? <laughs> oh, I, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's a gym short. It's yeah. a yeah. mesh. It's a mesh, and you're you know, and I'm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, where were we? Oh, Virgil. In the so, gym. We were um, in the gym. Virgil is, you know, force of nature. I mean, he's he's an incredible powerhouse. He always has been. He mm -hmm. was, he was the one who, um, you know, it was Virgil, it was Kanye, and it was Jerry. You know, and they were, mm -hmm. it was the they were kind of the three, and it, it was a blast being around them because it's just creative supernovas, yeah. right? Yeah. And I really enjoy being around people who are as highly creative as possible and when the copy they had was the copyright problem with pyrex mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. virgil was like would you come and look at my t-shirt line i'm doing a new t-shirt line and i decided to call it off white i remember wondering like where that came from but sure mm -hmm. and i came by and it was just me and him and he had like you know grabbed the corner of a showroom at a you know, Carla Otto or one of the PR people. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at the t-shirts. I was like, he's like, what do you think? I was like, it's, it's, they're great. And I know next season there's going to be a coat and a pair of pants and a pair of sneakers. And then I know the next season that there's going to be a hundred pieces. You could just tell mm -hmm. he had the fire in his belly. So I looked at those, those t-shirts and all I wanted was to see more stuff. Mm. And it was that moment that, you don't get a lot of those moments in fashion. I remember when Mucha Prada made the announcement that she was going to start doing clothes. Now that might seem a little bit weird because you think of Prada as being a clothing designer. Mm -hmm. right. But in those days, it was they were an accessory designer. They did bags and they did shoes and they did belts and 
you know, and she was going to do women's and then she was going to do men's. And we just couldn't imagine what it would look like. And from the first runway show, you knew that this was going to be huge. So even looking at those 11 T-shirts on that table, I knew it was really going to take off for him. And um, whatever's going on in his brain, he puts it into the product. Yeah. And you can say that's a that's a beautiful mind that is also someone who you know knows how to execute and knows how to you know experiment and you know there's there's really no stopping him and his references are far and wide he, he's an old soul mm -hmm. but he looks to the future and i think he's had great success with his collaboration with nike do those louis vuitton air force ones get you excited Did yes you see those yeah. very much so you're a fan of that very much so yes you mentioned your relationship with kanye west throughout the years you've worked with him for so long but one infamous shoot the nine hour shoot where he was just pulling from everywhere and i think correct me if i'm wrong was that he, he was wearing the adidas boosts in that with yeah, the leather pants so. was that before a yeezy dropped or was yeezy out by then i think it was right around the okay. same time did he mention like what i'm about to do with adidas or anything like that what kind of history do you have with him when it comes to his sneaker collaborations he pulled me into a meeting once with Adidas where they were literally like carving things out of clay, basically, and doing okay. uh, three dimensional drawings. And, you know, he's like, what do you like about this? What do you not like about it? I was like, there's too many eyelets. It's too high. It's too this. It's too that. And, you know, Kanye is a total futurist. Yeah. He, he's, he's someone who um, I worked with him last year, helping him with, with Easy Gap. And, you know, everything is... You know, it's super exciting working with him because he doesn't really, it's not that he doesn't have any references to the past, but he just wants to look forward. Mm -hmm. So I would say next to these sneakers, I don't know if you've ever put on the Yeezy Slides. I but have I six can, pairs in my house. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can do a whole day on a shoot in wow. Yeezy Slides. Yeah. That's, how, that's how well they're built. Yeah. So there's obviously a lot of care and craftsmanship that go into his easy collection but uh do you have the foam I, runners what's that the foam runner i don't have the foam runners because i'm a little bit nervous about <laughs> the size 13. <laughs> oh yeah it's a shoe that the yeah, size is a little quite bulbous. The size yeah. is a little right? weird on yeah. it too yeah to begin with. yeah yeah understandable next time you hit the beach you need a pair of foam runners i've been big i've been big on that he's good he's big on that yeah. yeah well last year when i was working with him in atlanta a lot of the people who work in the atelier had the foam runners mm. and um they're like, what do you want? And I was like, well, I want slide and um, now I'm forgetting the one, the one that's super colorful. It's like the yellow laces and the blue and the gray and the- 700 maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yep. I wear those a lot, which I like. Cause they have a little bit, you know, they're a little bit wider, mm -hmm. which is good for me. But um, so, you know, just a quick, you know, nod to that nine hour fitting. Yeah. He was, you know, we asked him to do a cover and many, many, many discussions. I love the process working with him mm -hmm. because I feel like, you know, it's not a confusing mind. Again, it's a beautiful mind and he has a way of, you know, and it all kind of makes sense. So when I got the idea for how I wanted to dress him, kind of based off this picture I did with Drake a few years ago where I, I put him in um, a military, it's in my book, it's the picture of him in the, the green military coat mm -hmm. with a green sweater and green pants and I found green boots and I just love the whole monochromatic thing. And, and I did a lot of monochromatic in the 80s but I just felt it was time to bring it back. So he's like, what are we? What are the clothes going to be? And I was like, well, let's meet at the Mercer, and I'll bring up some boards mm. and whatever. So I put these looks together that were all one color. Wait a minute, I have to ask. Yeah. Does Kanye know you were referencing Drake for the Kanye fit? Because I feel like that could be problematic. <laughs> well, it's not a. Well, I'm not trying to stir the pot here. It's not a direct is, reference. Okay. It was just something I had experimented. Because if Kanye knew that Drake was secretly influencing his fits, this could be this could be a whole they huge. Were friends. <laughs> yeah. Different level. There might be a tirade somewhere in the future. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I try to stay out of all that <laughs> My stuff. My words, but, not uh, yours. Please, please yes. go on, Jen. Um, no, you know, and, and it's funny because I spend so little time with some of the celebrities mm -hmm. that, in a way, not that I see them as mannequins, but, you know, 
there was a certain way I conceptualized that picture, mm. and it could have been Drake, could have been anyone else, but we needed a double page spread, and I really wanted to try this idea because in in addition to the men of the year issue being you know, the accomplishments that these men had, it was mm -hmm. also like, well, what are the fits of the year? Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the trends that, you know, kind of hit? And I wanted that to be somewhere in there, and Drake seemed to be the, the right place for it. So uh, so I put these boards together and did a quick, like, you know, grabbed a model in the GQ Fashion Clause and put some things together and made this board. He looked at it for 30 seconds. He's like, great, let's go have lunch. You know, it was... I was like, felt really good about it. But knowing Kanye and knowing, you know, <laughs> what I like to do is come into a shoot pretty well armed. Yeah. I like to be decisive mm -hmm. and know what I want to do and definitely steer the person into that. Yeah. But I want to bring him some extra things too. So it was actually Jerry, when we got to the fitting, who said, this is, this is dope, but look at all these clothes that Jim brought. Like, maybe we should... Play a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So playing a little bit <laughs> turned into nine hours. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, and Kanye, and you just yeah. So playing turned into like let's just try every single thing on, and I I think I remember never sitting, never having a drop of water or a thing to eat, but the nine hours went by in nine minutes. I mean, it was, did you have we the New Balances on so at that point? Because you did. mentioned wearing New Balances in order to help you stand on concrete floors that shoot, for many, though, many hours. I, yeah. I love that shoot. Also, there was a video behind the scenes that got taken down, which I love, though. I know. That video, like, I don't know if it <laughs> came from right, you guys, but that when video. When we filmed the entire nine-hour fitting. That video, and I think that's one of the first times he said, he says something at the end of it like, um, that I am like something like I am Picasso. I am Walt. It was like one of the first times he said yep. it. But the video I love because it was on some obscure Tumblr and it shows him putting right. things together. I don't even. I think you guys may have put it out for one or two days and then it got taken down. Right. It's a really good video. I try to find it. It's, it's not not there. Have, okay. <laughs> we got to dig. We got to dig. It's a really good video it. though. Have Have you spoken to Jerry about what he's doing? At Adidas now? We've had conversations about it, yeah. Have you, like, given him some insight on, like, maybe what he should do or references mm -mm. or no? No, no. Nothing I just, we can I'm, talk about in this forum. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan. I mean, that's, that tree, of course, Kanye is my dear friend, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. he's my guy. But I love Jerry, I love Virgil. They're all awesome. But um, I, somehow I knew during that fitting, because I don't know what it is, probably... I'm a stubborn Taurus that I was going to get him back to those 20 looks mm. that were all, but let them play, let us all play, you know, because I also keep a pretty open mind. And if we found something better, we found something better. But everything else we were playing with just felt like eclectic mixes of clothes. And this one color dressing I thought was just really going to establish. Um, and he was, you know, there's certain. I take I take a lot of it from his personal style, you know, because when you start to put a shoot together, he was wearing this Bottega suede Chelsea boots, mm -hmm. and he had them in like in three colors, and it was in his favorite color range, which is, you know, one of them was kind of the color of Joe's sweatshirt, and one mm -hmm. of them was kind of a, a chocolate brown, and one of them was kind of like a, almost like your pants on olive green, and those that was the co that's the color palette he'll always he always loves, you mm -hmm. know, he goes for he less he's less of you know, wearing a black, all black. He likes those kind of muddy, earthy tones. So there was a lot of that out in the in the in the in the culture, in the fashion sphere. And if you look back at the credits, you'll see that pretty much nothing is a head to toe look from a designer because it was more for me a head to toe color story. Mm -hmm. So in the yeah. in the end, he said he said, you know what, Jim's right. These clothes are great. Let's do it this way. And then <laughs> the day of the shoot, he's. It was easy, you know, and um, he was. We probably wrapped in two and a half hours, and you know, each each look was just. He would just step on set. There was very little fiddling to be done, and um, I, you know, and then from there, you know, Yeezy came out. Mm -hmm. Season one came out shortly after that. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Did you have the same premonition that you did around Virgil in terms of what Kanye was about to do in the world of footwear and the world of sneakers? I knew that Virgil was, you know, had great points of reference 
and he loved industrial design and photo and uh, typography and photography and he was a very worldly dude and yeah i thought he could build an empire especially after season two when off-white turned into um a more of a collection and then mm -hmm. season three was nebraska if you mm -hmm. remember but yeah. i'm saying for for kanye for the footwear oh did you have that same sense you know, when you said when you first saw Virgil's work, you, you could kind of see the timeline of this expanding in an exponential way. When Kanye was first doing the sneakers with Adidas or maybe even Nike before that, did you have that same sense that he was on his way to this level of domination? Yes, because long before we did the the one color dressing a fitting, he did a collection with Jean Tuitu at APC. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't yeah. know if you yeah. remember that. Mm -hmm. But and that was, you know, to his credit, that was a lot of you know similar colors but that's when he, it really felt like you know he was in this lane of you know surplus wear workwear yep. uh, but more sophisticated you know and he was a fanboy of Jean Tuitu's and Jean Tuitu had a way of modernizing these pieces so they didn't look like they were you know necessarily taken from the thrift stores or from from Army Navy, and I thought he did a phenomenal job at that. And I think at that point, it was kind of like, how do I complete the look, you know? And he had done the, he had done the Nike, but he hadn't done the the Adidas. And uh, I think Kanye is for. I think he's got a very focused mind. I think he has a very he has a very limited um, color palette that he loves, but he has a very very expansive mind. Mm -hmm. And you know, even putting, even working on. Uh, easy gap with him for the for the short time that I did it was you know he he's the one always asking for like how can we make something that maybe doesn't have any fastenings or how can we make mm -hmm. something that doesn't have a lot of seams in it or mm -hmm. you know he's always and and in a way if you look back at easy one that was a, that's a very very original collection and all of the collections since then um, have been have had a certain look to them and they're much more futuristic than 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 anything at his contemporaries. Joe, can we done. talk about the white shoes? Yeah, so be before we go, obviously, we have to talk about the Kith book. Yes. And 10 years seeing, you know, I, I'm sh you looked at every page, obviously, mm. and I'm sure you saw it from afar, but then working on the book, you saw it. And just like that trip down memory lane, but like, what was that like? Him, Eugene, Ronnie, responsible for me wearing my first pair of white <laughs> Air that, Force Ones. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. You convinced Joe? He, but and he, he was, was so squirming. Yeah, it's true. And, but and you know, that's I the behind the scenes he, video I want to see. But he was yeah. he off. You even offer. I don't know if you yes. were serious. You were like, you oh, can no, put of course these, I was serious. You could put these New Balances on, which yeah. and Ronnie right was off like, his feet? yes, off his feet. Those exact New Balances, yeah. because honestly, the fit would look good with those New Balances. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, were you were you asking? You're like, can yes. I put those on? <laughs> Yes, Eugene texted me like, Eugene texted me after the book came out, like, uh, he, he was like, because Ronnie tweeted about it, yeah. and like people were like, J Joe and White Sneakers or whatever, and Eugene was like, wow, it really is a scandal, but I get there, <laughs> I get to the shoot, I get to the shoot, and you know Ronnie, Ronnie is Ronnie, and I'm like, I love the fit, and then he was like, and you're wearing these, I was like, I don't, I, I don't wear white sneakers, and he was like, he just went, it's time, it's time, and I was like, <laughs> I think I told Eugene, I was like, I'm going to kill him. And then I was like, oh, I think Jim offered. Jim was like, you could wear these new balances. And Ronnie was like, all my friends are wearing white friends and family Air Force Ones. And I will say, I love the photo. But if there's anyone who could talk you into wearing. Yeah, Ronnie. And no, it's Ronnie. I'm saying Jim is it's like. Ronnie. His Jim, Ronnie, yeah. yes, yes. Well, Ronnie and Eugene known Joe longer than I have. I'm just, meet, <laughs> I'm just meeting Joe, right? And, <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm kind of, I'm, tr I'm trying to like. Well, let's solve this. I'll give him my he shoes. Was, yes. And, you know, or we can crop the picture. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Joe LaPuma, no feet. First time meeting him, I was like, this guy has worked with legends. I'm not going to act like, oh, I'm not Be a wearing bigger diva than Kanye or white whatever. White sneakers, yeah. but it, it worked out. Yeah. No, but I get it. I could feel your pain because it'd be someone <laughs> saying to me, we're going to put fluorescent orange sneakers on you. And, you know. I'd probably take the hit, but it was oh, my <laughs> like sweaty my palms, anxiety like, would yeah. be very uh, transparent. <laughs> yeah, at the time, but I thought you handled it really well, and in the end, um, came out great. It came out great. Definitely. Huge step. Now, do you think that will 
think you'll ever do it again, or should we just keep that as I a one-time thing? I don't know because thing? I'm still, I, this, like I said, the fit. Oh, I still man. think the fit would look amazing with those with those shoes. So <laughs> I don't know. This feels like this feels like one of those like freaky eater shows where someone's like hasn't right. eaten a vegetable in 20 years and no, like, he's like no, giving no, you a spoon, no. like put on these white yeah. shoes, Joe, will be fine. But I followed their lead and I'm really happy with it. Someone who like yeah, pictures, photo shoots. I'm like, I don't do a lot, but I was like, and I love that photo and they do look good. So. I appreciate it. But yeah, just to just to put a pin on that book, what is like your biggest takeaway working with Ronnie and and being front row for 10 years now that you worked on the book? Well, you know, Ronnie, um, the first thing Ronnie said to me was he brought me into the office mm -hmm. and he said, oh, I want to, you know. I just wanted to say that, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm thought of a I'm thought of a as a retailer mm -hmm. and not not so much a designer mm -hmm. and i said you can pin that on me because that was probably what i felt about you mm -hmm. but i know you're going to prove to me that you are a designer and i know you i know your your attention to detail is phenomenal but you know after we had that little conversation um and that's not what the meeting was about yeah. he slid over my book and he said you know i did what i think is my best collection and i've decided that I want to elevate the brand and I looked at your book and I thought everything was just so you know these the guys look so great mm -hmm. and the clothes and the photography and I just this these are the images I want and would you you know would you creative direct this thing with me and you know I thought we had like I just assumed we had about six months to do it because it took me a yeah. year to do yeah. my book. Yeah. And when he said, so it's July 29th at this time. I have to go to L.A. for four days, so I'm mm -hmm. not going to be back for like a week. And he's like, well, we got to get it to press around the 24th of August. <laughs> like 2022? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so what I realized very, I said, you know, let's let's do it. But, be, but this initial conversation, and you've known Ronnie a mm -hmm. really long time, mm -hmm. but... So I'm in two and a half hours in this conversation, and I feel like I know this. I've known this guy for yes. many years, even mm -hmm. though I've, you know, brushed up against him th throughout the business. But he, I realized that this guy's gonna, he's gonna make this happen. Yeah, you know, he's gonna really make this happen. And I think what he committed to, because the first thing I said is like, well, then you're gonna have to stay on a really short leash because we're gonna have to actually make decisions you know, when we see them, like we have to pick the frame, mm -hmm. it's gonna have to go to retouching, it's mm -hmm. gonna go have to go to layout, it's gonna have to go to press. So everything's gonna happen like that. And, you know, but he, you know, within 15 minutes, we had decided the photographer he said, who do you want to shoot? I was like, Sebastian Kim looked up yeah. his work. He's like, let's get him. It's August, I'm sweating. Cause I'm like, are we gonna, are these people gonna be in town? Are mm -hmm. celebrities even gonna be in mm -hmm. town? Uh, who should do the sets? What should the sets look like? What do you think for talent, we, you know? And we had kind of mapped the whole thing out. And Austin, who's his yeah. awesome yeah. art director, Austin. which we love, shout out to Austin, is you know made this big wall. Said we have to have this big wall, and it's got to have like you know 150 spreads on it. And we're just gonna have to start building. You know, we're gonna have to start building it. Like we're putting together a a book or a magazine very quickly. So then we we just then it was like okay, what's your favorite picture? you know, LeBron and the sneakers mm -hmm. in my sneakers. Okay, that's the first page. Then the second page is like, you know, what's the favorite picture of you? I don't want to be in this thing. Got to have a picture of you. Pick the one where he's on the floor with the sneakers. What's the third page? So what's, so then I said like, what's your favorite campaign of all time? And he said, oh, uh, Bella Hadid Versace. and the Versace campaign. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that's, we'll do that as a spread. And then we'll get into the introduction. So mm -hmm. we, we talked it kind of through very quickly, and then we had to do it. So it was it was a brilliant wow. um, project. I think I think the thing that I'm most proud of it is like I just keep looking at it, and I can't believe it happened. And I so think good. it looks really beautiful. And the team effort was incredible. But as I said in my Instagram last week, the thing my takeaway was like I got to meet these incredible people like Joe and this family that he has that is just. I mean, to him, f friends are family. There's yeah, no right. de yep. delineation. And to, to see that, and every day was just kind of a, we worked our ass off, but in a very warm, fuzzy, wonderful way. And to see the way Ronnie treats the people that work for him and just people in general or someone on the street who wants to take a picture of him. And mm -hmm. it, I just felt, you know, this is, this is incredible. I'm in the 
presence of greatness and you know we're gonna get this thing done it's gonna be great so are you so, officially invited to the next we always joke where they do these big tr kith trips you know where they go to hawaii <laughs> you go to uh, aspen yeah you i'm sure he is i don't know i'm like sitting on the outside like am i ever gonna like you know is my pass gonna work you know <laughs> but uh no was uh incredible experience yeah love ronnie well, and got to meet Joe. Yeah, which was, it was, which was great, really special. Definitely great working with you on on that, and uh, just like so many legendary, like I think I told you, I always used to read that first product spotlight that you would do in GQ, and um, just been a fan of you for years. And we thank you yes. today for taking the time and chopping it up with us. And uh, yeah, what what um any big projects that you could talk about going forward? Um. I talked to you about a um, couple that I can't. Yeah, uh, I'd have to say that. Yeah, okay. a couple we'll, that I can't. <laughs> All right, so we'll be on the lookout. We'll, we'll catch up. Yeah, a couple that we'll I can't. Up. But I think uh, what I am doing, I'm working. A, I'm working a lot with Todd Sider lately. Okay, and we're yes. um, and he's starting to really expand the brand. Awesome. A lot. So I'm looking forward to an even bigger role there. But um, you have some things up my sleeve that will be announced soon. Always beautiful. So, we can't wait. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Such Jim. a pleasure really to be here. It. it was really an honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This has been the Complex Sneakers Podcast. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Please like and subscribe. We are off next week. We will see you in two weeks.